Nancy. Uh, there, oh, it's live. Okay, fantastic. Okay, welcome everybody. If anyone out there can hear us, uh, we're going to be starting uh, in a couple of minutes at one o'clock. Uh, but I'll just uh, say hello for now. And please feel free to tell us where you're coming from or where you're watching from. And also feel free to uh, let us know if you have a favorite pollinator. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna let some, I'm gonna let people in waiting room. Um, I can hear feedback from the Facebook. Does anyone have their computer? Sorry, that was me. Okay. Uh, so no. I turned that off. I was just wanted to make sure that it was live. Yeah. Okay. Sounds and it is. It, and there's about a, so just for Tia, there's about a 20 second delay to when you, you speak and when it comes out to Facebook. Okay. So in case you're wondering. She was saying her favorite pollinator is a hummingbird. Oh, fantastic. Okay. okay, we will get started in one minute. It's 12.59. Hummingbirds are fun to watch, especially when they chase each other around. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so it's one o'clock, so I think we're going to get started. Um, I hope uh, everyone's doing well. Welcome. Um, we're also, we're here on Zoom and we're also uh, live on Facebook as well. And uh, thanks for joining us for our BD at Home, uh, Meet the Pollinators. And we're very lucky today we have uh, Tia uh, Hapalainen. Uh, from the Spencer Zoological Collection. There she is waving. She's also dressed like a bee, uh, which is great. Um, and I just want to introduce you to all the faces that you'll be seeing and voices you'll be hearing. So obviously Tia uh, will be talking to us uh, for the most time. Uh, my name is Kashifa. I'll be hosting um, and I'll be reading out your questions. And then we also have Nancy who will be facilitating. Uh, she'll be also helping with the questions and uh, especially your questions on Facebook. Uh, she'll be reading. There she is. Um, before we uh, before we go over to Tia, I just want to spend a couple minutes giving you a little introduction of the museum uh, and just doing a quick land acknowledgement as well. Um, so the Bidi Museum is on the traditional unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam people. Um, June is uh, Indigenous History Month, and so I, I did want to um, include the museum, uh, the Musqueam website. Um, if you'd like to learn more about them, so muscium.bc.ca. But I also wanted to include a link to the First Peoples Map of BC. If you live in other parts of the province, um, I encourage you to use this resource to learn more about the land that you live on, the language that has um, historically been spoken. And of course, if you're in different uh, other parts of the world, uh, there will be traditional territory there as well. So I encourage you to learn a little bit about that. Uh, we're also here in Vancouver. There you can see us on the peninsula. Um, we're on uh, campus of UBC, University of British Columbia, and we're one of many museums on campus. We have the Pacific Museum of Earth, the Museum of Anthropology. Uh, there's also the Botanical Garden and the Belkin Art Gallery. Lots of really wonderful places to visit when it's safe to do so. And this is what the museum looks like on the outside. Um, you can see the biggest specimen in the museum, the blue whale hanging there in our atrium. Uh, but the, the whale is actually just one of over 2.1 million specimens in the museum. So we have lots of other very cool things. Um, and, and I will tell you about the collections in just a minute. Um, I just want to also mention that 
right uh, connected to the museum is the Biodiversity Research Center, where there, uh, there's lots of faculty and graduate students and postdoctoral researchers, and they study all aspects of biodiversity. So you can see some of the topics here on the screen as well. And then I want to tell you a little bit about the six collections that are represented in the museum. So on the screen, you can see uh, from the, the top left, there's the uh, tetrapod collection, which has mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, next to that is the marine invertebrates, things from the ocean without a backbone. Next to that is the herbarium, uh, which has plant and plant-like organisms, uh, the fish and fossils. And then on the bottom left, you can see the Spencer Entomological Collection represented, which is, uh, which is uh, where Tia works. And uh, uh, that's a great segue. So I will hand it over to you, Tia. Great, thank um, you yeah. for the that's intro. So I'm going to do a little talk today on pollinators. So it's meant to be an introductory talk. So um, some of you may know some of this already, but we're going to get into a little more detail as we go along. Feel free to ask questions as we go, <clears throat> but there'll also be time for questions at the end. So here's a little bit about me. I'm the collections assistant, and I've been with the um, collection for a year and a half now. Pollinators are my specialty and they're something I love to talk about. So I'm pretty excited to be here today. So first we're gonna do some of the basics. What is pollination? I know you're here to listen to uh, learn more about pollinators, but I figured we should at least cover the basics of pollination. Maybe some of you don't know what that entails exactly. So it's just moving of pollen grains from the male part of the plant called the anther, where the pollen grains are held onto the stigma. And uh, that results in fertilization of the, um, the ovule, which then becomes the plant embryo. And this is how um, plants reproduce that are flowering. And flowering plants are called angiosperms. And 80% of plants on earth are angiosperms. And of those, 85.7% are pollinated by insects. So the vast majority of plants are flowering and the vast majority of those called flowering plants are pollinated by insects. There are um, other methods of pollination. They kind of break down roughly into bi abiotic and biotic. Abiotic meaning that there's not a biological mechanism or factor behind it. So wind or water are the main examples for that. And then for biotic, it's any animal moving the pollen around uh, for the plant. So kind of, it's a mutualistic uh, relationship. So it can be insects, birds, bats, rodents, marsupials, or even reptiles. And now we're just gonna quickly go through some examples of those with pictures. So. This is an orchid from Southeast Asia that is rain pollinated. It only blooms during the rainy season because of this. Here we have uh, eelgrass. So it lives underwater in the ocean. It flowers underwater and the pollen is thus moved by the water. Not something you would normally think about, but yes, we do have plants that will flower underwater. This is an oak tree that is flowering. It's a quercus and so it has uh, wind pollinated flowers that you can see here. And this is wheat. So grass is a flowering plant and so wheat is a flowering plant as well, but it's wind pollinated. And then here I'm going to show you some of the animal examples of animal pollination. Here we have a solitary bee showing off its impressive tongue on a flower. And we have one of our local hummingbird species. I know someone said they love hummingbirds. This is a rufous hummingbird. They don't stay year round here, whereas annas do, but they are excellent pollinators as well. We have a bat here pollinating agave. So if you like tequila, you can thank a bat for that. And there's also even rodents and mammals that do pollinating. So here's an elephant shrew in South Africa um, visiting a plant for nectar that it is uh, the main pollinator for. And so 
that's just covering the basics of uh, abiotic and biotic pollination. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into um, each of those. So now the biotic pollinators. Birds are really excellent pollinators and they tend to be most common in the tropics as pollinators, southern Africa, and then some island chains that are lacking uh, the insects that would normally be there to do pollinating. I love this photo because you can just see the pollen all over the face of the bird. So you can see how when the bird pushes its face into the flower, it gets that pollen all over its face. And then when it goes to visit another flower, it'll be moving that pollen and then fertilizing uh, the, the uh, seeds there. And I love this photo as well because I know a lot of people think bats are, um, you know, night flyers that eat insects. Um, that's true for many bat species. In the tropical regions though, there's many bat species that uh, pollinate flowers that only open at night and they use their echolocation to find the flowers. And this is common in tropical regions and in desert regions. There's also rodent pollination that can occur and it's much less common. Um, it is seen in um, South Africa where it's very dry and there's not a lot of uh, insect diversity to do the pollinating. Here's another picture of a cute little elephant shrew on a flower covered with pollen. So another example of a mammal pollinator here. There's even some cases of reptile pollination. So it might seem bizarre to you because they're not fuzzy at all. Um, it's rare and it tends to happen more so in island chains where there's a lot of major animal groups that aren't um, living on the island. So these plants have adapted to have lizard pollinators instead. So now to more familiar things that you might see in your own backyard. We tend to have um, insect pollinators as the dominant pollinators here in Canada. So I'm talking about insects because that's my specialty. Um, I'm happy to talk about hummingbirds as well because I am a birder, um, but I'm here officially more as an entomologist. So here's some of the major insect groups that are uh, the major pollinators. So bees, this is an example um, of a mining bee. They're quite small and they're solitary bees. They don't live socially. We have a wasp. They're another common pollinator group um, that you'll see visiting flowers in your garden. Flies. So this is the close-up of a fly face. I did kind of mug shots for the usual suspects here. Uh, flies uh, also visit flowers and can be important pollinators as well. And then this you might not recognize uh, because you can't see its main feature that you normally might notice, but this is a close-up of a butterfly's face. And you're seeing on the front here is the coiled tongue that they use for sipping nectar when they visit flowers. So if you want to learn about what kind of pollinators uh, you can see out and about in your yard or while you're going for a walk in your neighborhood, um, there's some basics you can start to observe and they'll help you discern between these major groups that I just covered of insects. So first we're going to do an easier comparison. Um, this is bee versus flower fly. So we have a bit of a specific flower group or fly group that we're referring to here because flies um, are an incredibly diverse group and you just can't say um, characteristics that are carried across the entire group. So I went with flower flies because they are very common flower visitors and they look a lot like bees as well. So it can be easy to mix them up with bees. So the important things to look at are the antenna, which are much longer on a bee and they're short on a fly. And then you can look at the eyes next if you're able to get close to observe them. Flies tend to have large bulging eyes. They often take up most of the head of the insect, whereas wasps and bees will have much smaller eyes. 
the next feature, if you're really have good eyes, can be the wings. Um, this can be a little harder to see, um, but flies only have two wings, whereas bees, wasps, butterflies, and every other type of insect uh, has four wings. And then the abdomen is another one. Bees tend to be much hairier. Uh, flies will be striped at times to mimic bees, but they don't tend to be as hairy as bees. And then a fly, while it might be a pollinator, it's never actively collecting pollen. And so it won't be carrying pollen on its legs in these big bunches that you will see on a bee. So if you're seeing big blobs of pollen on the legs, it's definitely a bee because only bees will do that. So this is just reiterating the points that were on the previous slide, um, but showing a real insect and a, a real bee and a real fly. Um, a big shout out, this image was taken from uh, the Bees in Your Backyard website. It's an amazing resource. It's a book, it's a website, and they also have social media. And if you're looking to learn more, um, I would highly recommend checking that out. The links are at the bottom of this slide, or um, if you want to know, know more, we can talk about it later. And so moving on from bee versus fly, we can talk about bee versus wasp. So this can be a little bit trickier because these uh, in two types of insects are much more closely related than the previous two. So between bees and wasps, um, wasps tend to have a much more obvious waist and um, their abdomen tends to be less hairy as well. They'll have the striping again, but not the, the furry fuzziness that a lot of bees have. Wasps also won't be collecting pollen on their body. They will visit flowers and they can be pollinators, but they're not actively collecting pollen like bees. And then wasps tend to have narrow wings that they fold over their back. Um, bees will do that too. This image is a little misleading. They don't hold their wings out like that on a flower, but they tend to have uh, much broader wings and they don't hold them back on their, uh, over their abdomen in the same way that wasps do. And so now I'll show you another comparison, but instead of with cartoons with real insects, Ah, here we go. Now, a lot of people want to know what's the difference between bees and wasps. So wasps don't collect pollen. They will sometimes eat it. Um, they tend to go for nectar more than anything though. And bees collect pollen and they do that using specialized hairs on their body that are branched. And these branched hairs um, have kind of a fluffy feathery appearance and that branch structure allows them to pack pollen grains and carry them. And so bees will always have branched hair somewhere on their body, whereas wasps never do. So here's an, another summary slide, just showing you a fly, a bee, and a wasp. And these are three that can look quite similar. They're all metallic blue-green, so it can be tricky. But again, look at the eyes, the antenna, the waist, the wings, and these can all be clues to help you separate these groups and learn uh, what you're seeing in your yard or on your walks outside. Here's another one, just to, again, to show you that mimicry abounds and that uh, telling the difference between these can be quite tricky. So I especially like the top left photo because that is a moth. And um, while I covered flies and wasps that can look like these, it might surprise you to know that there are also moths out there that can be very deceptive and look a lot very bee-like. And they will fly during the day as well. So. Um, it can be very tricky, but it's got fluffy antenna and just not that obvious waist and um, just different looking wings as well. And now we're going to talk about bees as pollinators. So bees are 
the most important group of insect pollinators because uh, they're the only group of insects that rely on pollen for all of their protein for their developing young. Um, because of this, they have this really close relationship with plants. Um, when you think about it, a lot of that pollen is actually being eaten by the young bees, which is actually a loss for the plant, but enough of the pollen gets moved around um, that it's still a benefit, uh, beneficial relationship to the plant. And so they've evolved this close relationship um, where some plants are even only pollinated by one type of insect or one species of bee sometimes. So it may surprise you to know as well that uh, adult bees don't eat nectar. It's just the developing young that need it to grow. Once they're not growing anymore, bees um, just use nectar for their energy for getting around. And there's 20,000 species of bees worldwide. It's estimated in British Columbia here, we have between 450 and 600 species of bee. And we are the most diverse province in Canada for bee species. Our hotspots here are the Gary Oak ecosystem and the uh, Okanagan interior desert and grasslands ecosystem. This photo is of a leaf cutter bee. So what you're seeing under the abdomen is pollen. I wanted to point out to you that not all bees collect pollen on their legs. This family of bee collects pollen under their abdomen, which you can see on the female here. Here's another member <laughs> of the family. Um, sometimes they get so much pollen on them, it's just all over their head, their body, and the place where they're actually trying to spare the pollen. Um, you can see how pollen transfer happens just from them moving around and thrashing around in the pollen. Um, they just can't really help it. Here's another great example of a native bee uh, with huge fluffy legs uh, packed with pollen. So again, these are special branched hairs that can hold the pollen grains until they get back to their nest where they deposit the pollen for their developing young to eat. And here's a beautiful sweat bee with pollen on its legs. It's a green metallic sweat bee, one of my favorites. You can see these here locally. This is a type of orchid bee. So these are tropical. Just wanted to show you some of the amazing diversity worldwide. Um, you can see the pollen on the legs and the long tongue on this bee. Orchids often have um, very specialized structures. And so these guys need long tongues to reach the nectar and the floral uh, perfumes in the orchids that they collect. Another just to show you the diversity of bees out there, this is a crazy uh, bee from the deserts of South America. It's got this crazy long face and tongue because desert flowers don't have large openings because all the nectar would just evaporate instantly. They have very tight openings and long flowers. And so this bee has adapted specially to pollinate uh, desert flowers. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about wasps as pollinators. So um, bees are the best known, of course, but there's plenty of wasps that are important pollinators as well. So keep in mind, I know a lot of people are afraid of wasps um, because some can be aggressive around their nests, but uh, many wasps are um, not aggressive at all if they're not near their nest and they're great to observe on flowers and they're often important pollinators as well. So I love this photo because I think a lot of people don't realize that wasps can be quite hairy as well. This is a, a yellow jacket wasp, similar to a species you would see around here. And so even though they're not actively collecting the pollen, they're hairy and so they're picking it up and moving it around incidentally. This is a special exception. This is a pollen wasp. So it's a little bit strange. It's a wasp, technically. It doesn't have branched hairs on its body, but it collects pollen and its larva can only grow and develop on pollen. They're kind of the exception in the wasp world 
um, in that their young totally develop on pollen. They're the only non-bee that kind of does that. Here's another hairy wasp. We don't have this uh, species here on the coast, but it's a type of scolid wasp. Um, they can be found in the Okanagan and then it, further south from here. Very hairy, just showing you how easy it is for some of these insects to incidentally pick up pollen and carry it around with them while they're visiting flowers for nectar. And this is actually a uh, spider wasp. So they specialize in hunting spiders for their young to eat. Um, but there is certain circumstances. Um, I wanted to show you this example of one because there was a recent paper that came out. Uh, well, sorry, 2006 isn't recent. <laughs> I just made myself sound very old. Um, <laughs> so there was a specialized uh, pollination where there's this African milkweed plant and there's only uh, a wasp that pollinates it. So again, Southern Africa, because it's an arid ecosystem, it tends to develop these really kind of interesting uh, relationships where you don't get traditional pollinators happening. This is the same place where we see um, mammals doing pollination as well. So just a kind of a cool exception um, out there where sometimes a wasp does all the pollinating for a plant. And on to flies as pollinators now. So I love this photo just to show you again how this is a fly, it's not a bee. It's got two wings. Um, it's in the, uh, the bee fly family, so it looks a lot like a bee. And it's very hairy. And so even though it's not collecting pollen for its young to develop, it's still visiting flowers for nectar, for energy. It's got a hairy body, and so it will be moving pollen around as well. This is a great example of a flower fly that I was using as an example earlier that mimic bees with the pattern on their abdomen, but um, they don't uh, do pollen collecting the way bees do, but again, visit flowers frequently. Um, their young often develop on flowers, and so they move pollen around as well, incidentally. You can see a bit of a outline of hair around the uh, abdomen of this fly here. This isn't a flower fly, this is a tinted fly, but look at the hair on the abdomen. It's got these big black bristles on its body. And so um, even if it's not a flower fly, lots of flies will visit flowers for the nectar. It's cheap energy, keeps you going, they're plentiful in the spring. And so you can see how a fly like this would easily move pollen around as well. And then uh, this is great. These are some things that are fly pollinated. So trilliums are fly pollinated. Um, things that are fly pollinated tend to uh, not have the showy colors um, that bee pollinated plants do. Uh, here's Jack in the pulpit. And they'll also often um, have a rotten scent to attract flies as well. Uh, think of skunk cabbage, which is found locally. It's fly pollinated. And so it's um, exploiting flies that are attracted to dung or rotting things. And it's mimicking those smells to get, attract flies that will do the pollination for it. And now this is our last group of insect pollinators. So butterflies and moths as poly Oh, sorry, second last, we have beetles after this. <laughs> so butterflies are of course what everyone thinks of with this group. Um, they're out during the day as opposed to moths which, which tend to be more nighttime active. Um, and so they're something people tend to be very familiar with. They visit flowers uh, for nectar. You can see this swallowtail has its long tongue extended into the flower to drink the nectar. The famous monarch, I wanted to point this out because many uh, butterflies as well as moths have developed a very special relationship with plants where their larva can only grow and develop on a narrow range of plants or in this case, just one plant. And so the monarch caterpillars 
uh, can only grow and develop on milkweed and they use the toxins present in the milkweed plant and integrate them into their own bodies as a way to deter predators from eating them. Here's a day flying moth, but just to point out that moths aren't strictly nighttime flyers. Uh, this is a moth that is mimicking a bumblebee. That's why it's got the yellow and black striped body and the clear wings. There's also um, moths that will mimic hummingbirds as well, and they're day flying as well. So there are day flying moths that are important pollinators. And then there's um, another very special relationship I wanted to point out, just like with the monarch, this is a moth species that uh, pollinates yucca in the United States and it is the only insect that pollinates this plant. So just to point out that some pollinators are generalists and they'll visit all sorts of flowers, but some have developed a very, very, very close uh, special evolutionary relationship with just one plant. Here's another um, moth visiting orchids. Um, many orchids, are pollinated by moth. This one in particular, it has a very long uh, projection off the back of it that contains the nectar and only a moth has a tongue long enough to reach it. And so it's attracting this specialized pollinator just to its flower that it's evolved a shape um, special just to the, the insect it wants to attract. And our last group, um, not something many people have thought about, but there are plenty of beetles that are pollinators as well. This is, um, they're especially important in semi-arid ecosystems. So again, Southern Africa, but also in Southern California, there's many uh, beetle pollinators. There's many beetle species that will eat pollen as a major food source and have hairy bodies. So they're not collecting pollen for their young, but they're eating it, visiting flowers frequently. And with their hairy bodies, they end up moving that pollen around from flower to flower. And though they're probably the least recognized pollinator group, I wanted to point it out because um, they can be quite important as well. Here's one eating pollen. This is a tiny tumbling flower beetle. Sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, dozens of these on a single flower. And so they can make up really high numbers in the ecosystem. This is a, a hairy fly, or sorry, beetle, just to show you again, the hairy body that would pick up pollen and move it from flower to flower as they move about feeding on the pollen. And then some of them, just like the moths and the flies, will mimic bees and wasps um, as a tactic to keep uh, predators away from them. So here's a, a beetle that can be found here in BC and it's mimicking a wasp and it's often found on flowers feeding on pollen. And I wanted to point out another recent study where um, they found this beetle encased in amber and uh, it actually, they think it's possibly the one of the earliest insect pollinators and the finding um, pushed back the insects uh, pollinating relationship, uh, earliest relationship by 50 million years. So um, not only did it push that uh, evolutionary relationship way back in time, but beetles may have been the very first ones to start visiting flowers and pollinating them. And then I just wanted to point out that if you're interested in learning more about pollinators and you're here in British Columbia locally, um, there's a new nonprofit society, uh, the, BC, the BC Native Bee Society. And so they have a Twitter, a Facebook, and a website. And so if you're interested in becoming more active and learning more, um, they're also a great resource and do lots of outreach as well. So that's kind of my crash course in pollinators and pollination. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions. I also have a quiz if you want to test your skills on identifying flies from bees and wasps. I think we have a question. 
Okay, Tia, I just wanted to uh, pass on some questions and comments from the Facebook. Um, so uh, from Shupeng's five-year-old, uh, it was with a, with a photograph of the butterfly. The question is, I see that butterfly has bright colors, orange, black, white, like snakes and mushrooms. I wonder if that butterfly is poisonous. Is it poisonous? So uh, the butterfly is not poisonous. Many butterflies are brightly colored. Um, and not because they're poisonous, but because they use it as a way to communicate with each other. And so um, they're trying to attract mates or they're trying to do territorial displays. And these colors um, are sending cues to each other, um, not necessarily just predators that are trying to eat them. And so that's often why they'll also have one color when their wings are open and a different color on the underside. And so the butterfly can choose when to communicate that message by opening or closing its wings. Fantastic, great question too. Um, I'm going to also just pass on some comments. Uh, Sunny says he thinks he's seen the hummingbird hawk moths before. Japan. Uh, some people, uh, Apollo loved how uh, the, one of the, um, the moths was so fluffy. I think that was on the yucca. Uh, then uh, Sunny mentioned uh, how he likes how bees are so diverse physically and functionally. And Shupeng and Sunny never knew about the green bees before. So that was the uh, the uh, sweat bees. And, They're my uh, personal favorite. <laughs> they, they love that too. Uh, and the uh, Paula and uh, Dale loved your costume, by the way. Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I know you can't see all of it, but. <laughs> <laughs> so people feel free to type out questions and we can ask uh, Tia questions as well. I'm going to pull up. I just have a really basic uh, slide of the common bumblebees you'll see in around Metro Vancouver. And I thought it might be great to leave up for people just so they can take a peek at it. Uh, Tia, there are two questions uh, in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll let you bring up the, the slide and then I'll, yeah. There we go. Awesome. Um, so there's a question from Patty in the chat. Um, asking, are honeybees a more effective pollinator than a native bee, or is it the reverse of this? Great question from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom. Um, so native bees are um, much better pollinators in general because, um, A, they've co-evolved with the native plants here um, to have a close relationship with them. And so uh, that close evolution means the timing of flowering and bee activity is often closely synced, as well as the morphology of the bee's tongue and body uh, in regard to the flower shape. But more importantly, um, honeybees, because they create honey, that's what they're named after, they're very nectar driven. Um, they need a lot of nectar to make honey. And so they tend to be more nectar driven than pollen driven. Native bees don't make honey. They leave a ball of pollen for their uh, young to develop on. And so they focus a lot more on pollen. And just because of that nature, they move way more pollen around because they focus on pollen rather than nectar. Awesome, great. We have, we have a few more questions. Uh, Teresa is asking, did the amber have a large bee and a small beetle or was the big insect the beetle? That was just a beetle in there. So that might have been a bit hard to see because um, I think there's some air bubbles in the amber as well. Um, but yes, that's just uh, the beetle and it's a very close up photo of it. So um, I have a I had a photo um, of that tumbling flower beetle and it, it's a similar one to that in the same family. It would be quite small, but the image makes it look really large. Awesome. Uh, Lori asks, what is your favorite bee? Um, my favorite bee is, um, it's closely related to the green metallic one. Um, it's in the same family. Um, so they're subgenus dialectus for the taxonomists out there. Um, they're a type of sweat bee. They're small metallic sweat bees. They're my favorite because they're tiny. Um, they're almost the size of ants and they often just look kind of black or brown. And so most people don't 
even notice them or realize they're bees, but they're incredibly diverse. They're probably the most diverse bee group in Canada. Um, and because they're so diverse and so small, they can be really hard to tell the difference between different species. And my cat just jumped up and was looking at my box of insects. <laughs> okay, snakes. Um, and so they're my favorite because they're so diverse, but they're also kind of like tricky. And so I, I appreciate the fact that um, you have to really know what they are in order to, to, to see them and find them. Awesome. There's quite a few questions, just so you know. Um, yeah. So uh, Judy asks, when you showed the photo of the paranthidium bee compared mm -hmm. to the moth, uh, fly wasp, yes. that bee had very small antennas compared to the others. Is that unusual? Uh -huh. Now, I think that may have been the angle the photo was taken at. Let me see if I can actually pull up that uh, slide, because I think it was just the way the photograph was taken um, the antenna was going towards the lens, and so it looks smaller. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so it's just the way it's been uh, photographed. So the one antenna is going out of the uh, depth of frame, and the other one's coming straight at you. And so it, it looks like it's short, but it's just um, it's out of the depth of focus of the, the photo, unfortunately. And I know it's tricky because I said flies have short antenna and then here's a fly with long antenna. But that's there's an exception to every rule. And so that's why insect watching is fun. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Rohit asks, what is the most common bee in BC? Ooh, um, well, just by numbers, I would say the non-native honeybee because it's used so extensively in agriculture. They also, um, they're social bees. Um, the only native social bees we have are, are bumblebees, um, but honeybees have colonies that are 10 times bigger than any bumblebee colony individually. And then add on top the fact that you know, we're artificially inflating their numbers for agriculture um, and we're managing them in a human way. So um, honeybees are important for agriculture, but I kind of call them, um, they're kind of like the cows or the chickens of the uh, insect world. So they're, they're the most abundant, but they're domesticated and technically not native here. Um, if it was a native species of bee, most numerous, um, I would say bumblebees. Um, you see lots of them out there. I couldn't pick one piece, species per se, but um, you know they're just everywhere. And because they're active for such a long period of time, bumblebees are active from you know March into October, whereas most other bees have kind of a narrow window that they're active. So if it's a native bee, I would say bumblebees are the most. And so they're awesome. a great place to start, which is why I had that bumblebee slide up. Because if you want to start somewhere, starting with bumblebees is a great place. Great. Um, Judy asks, my mason bees work so hard carrying soil and pollen back and forth. How many trips do they make to enclose each egg? Um, it depends on the bee. It often will take, um, you know, 20, 30 trips for each uh, pollen uh, bundle they leave for young um, and so that's another reason why native bees can be really effective is because um, they can be smaller and so they're having to visit more flowers to get the pollen they need and more visits means more pollen moving around. Awesome. Uh, Melanie says uh, my daughter Anna five years old is asking how long do bumblebees live? That's a great question um, it, because it's interesting in that it depends on their case. So bumblebees, as I said, they're the only social native bee. And that means um, in that they're social, that they have uh, a colony that cooperates together. And so you have a queen, you have workers, and then you have the males, which are sometimes called drones. Um, more so with honeybees and bumblebees. 
And so um, a queen bumblebee is much longer lived than any of the other eight. She lives the entire season, the entire lifetime of the colony. Um, so that can be, you know, anywhere from a couple of months if conditions are great, or it could be, you know, six to eight months, the life of a colony. Um, whereas the workers tend to live more so, you know, three weeks to six weeks kind of a thing. And then the males are not very long lived at all. They're kind of the live fast, die young. They're just out there to have a good time. Um, they're there for mating and that's it. And they also are, tend to be produced um, for a narrow window of time towards the end of the summer when the colony is starting to die and they need to produce new queens for the following year. That's when the males start coming out and the new queens. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we've got Paula asking uh, for uh, about the wasps' uh, hairs. So, so wasps can have hairs, but their hairs are different from those that bees have. Can you explain that again, uh, please, Tia? Yeah, I, I, I feel like I did breeze over that a little bit more. Um, so um, bees have branched hairs. So while wasps can be hairy. The individual hairs are simple. It's just a single uh, filament or strand, uh, whereas all bees have branched hairs. So think of um, like a feather or a plant that branches. So there's like a main stem and then there's other hairs that come off of it. And that um, gives those hairs kind of a feathery, fluffy, uh, the hairs are actually called plumos, uh, referring to their featheriness, and that branching structure is what allows the pollen to get packed in there and not just kind of slide out. And so bees have those special branching hairs for collecting pollen. Thanks, Tia. And then Vivian says uh, she's recently saw a very large bee, three quarters of an inch maybe. Could this be a queen bee? And then uh, with the description, she thought it was definitely a bumblebee, like looked like an Eastern bumblebee, large black bum. It was a big bee though. Yes, um, definitely a queen. You tend to see them in the spring, um, but each species will have a slightly different season, so to speak. And so um, one species might have queens that are out in February, a species that is more active later in the summer, um, you would still be seeing queens for now. And so if you're seeing a really big bumblebee, um, it's most likely a queen. It's the ones that are so big you see it, you're like, how do you even fly? Because mm -hmm. they look like they can hardly even get their, you know, their abdomen off the ground. And it's most likely uh, definitely a queen. And they'll behave differently sometimes as well. That's another way you can tell. Instead of just visiting flowers, um, you can catch them doing this behavior where they're searching for a nesting site. And so they're out. They haven't started their colony yet. They don't have any workers. And so she's out looking for a, a place to start the colony. And you'll see them and they'll just kind of, they'll be hovering near the ground instead of visiting flowers. And they'll be investigating cracks and crevices and holes. And sometimes you'll even see them land in like leaf litter and they'll even like dig around a little bit. And that's a queen and she's looking for a spot where she can start a nest. Um, so that's another good way to tell the queens from the workers. Fantastic. Um, and from Xu Peng again with her son, her five-year-old son, Richard, um, he asks, do bees like sweet flowers or stinky flowers and why? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, um, I sort of touched on this earlier. Um, the, the bees are using the nectar for energy, so they do like sweet flowers um, and things that are kind of bad smelling, like the skunk cabbage I showed, uh, tend to be fly pollinated. Um, but I would also point out that maybe something that uh, smells nice or bad to us might not smell bad to a bee. So not locally, but I, I did have a slide of that metallic green orchid bee with the really long tongue. Um, and they not only collect pollen, but they collect perfumes and oils and resins in the tropics. And some of the uh, perfumes they collect are 
not good smelling, but they create this custom perfume that the females love and um, we might not like it, but for some reason it's their, their custom perfume mix that attracts the females for that species. And so um, I know it's a, I waffled on the answer. It can be um, true that some bees like bad smelling things, but bad smelling things can also be trying to attract flies instead. That's a really excellent point. I also wonder if maybe they've gone walking and seen uh, skunk, skunk yes. cabbages, which are great for flies too, right? Yeah, you, um, you often smell a patch of it before you see yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Shupeng, the mom, she asks, um, what can we do to help bees live well? Planting flowers is a great option. Um, I'm in an apartment, so I know um, people who don't have a yard can feel maybe there's not much they can do, but I would like to encourage you that um, even if you're in an apartment, um, that's a great option is just having some flowers on your balcony. I have some that I brought in from my balcony to show you guys. Um, not only are they great for your mood, but the bees love them as well. I'm on the second floor of an apartment I get all species of wild bees, even the teeny tiny ones I was telling you about. I'm way up on the second floor. I get the teeny, teeny, tiny dialectus sweat bees that are my favorite, and it just makes me so happy. So flowers are a great option. Um, another thing, if you can, is just leaving um, some ground undisturbed. Most of our wild bees are ground nesting. Um, leaving a patch of... Um, yard or dirt or soil just don't dig it up um don't till it don't weed it sometimes doing nothing is the best thing you can do <laughs> so with any uh species that is threatened the biggest threat is habitat loss so whether it's um habitat that provides food or nesting that's the best thing you can do is to try and provide them with more and because they're insects you can have a really big impact. Um, they don't need a huge uh, 400 square kilometer parcel of land to sustain them like wolves do. Um, a pot with a California lilac growing in it can be enough food and nesting space for a species of bee to complete its whole life cycle on your balcony. So that's a great option. If you can't do that, you're not a gardener, you've got a black thumb, <laughs> you can always, um, just become more active in uh, local nonprofit societies like the Native Bee Society I suggested, or um, buying plants that don't use pesticides is another great option. Um, and learning more about them, that's the best thing. The more people care, the better it is for the bees. Awesome. Uh, we, 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 it is 1.50. Um, so we're, we do have questions, but we'll just, I think we'll have to go maybe a little faster, oh, but we'll get so through fast. them. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> um, Sheila asks, since honeybee need, honeybees need honey for their young, which bees are primary in terms of producing honey specifically? So honeybees um, use honey as a winter resource or a resource when uh, um, their other food resources are scarce. Um, so it's kind of a backup. Um, they're the only bee, even our social bumblebees, they don't survive the winter. They only the queen will overwinter. Honeybees, the whole colony keeps going all year round. And so that's why they need so much honey. Um, to sustain them, because it's that big colony, not just the queen, it's so much larger than any other social bee. Um, and they are the main bee that produces honey commercially. There are other bee species that produce honey, but not here in Canada. Um, in the tropics, there are other members of the genus Apis that produce honey. And then there's also, uh, in South America, there's uh, a group of stingless bees. They're much smaller and they're not as closely related to honeybees. 
um, that also produce honey. And it's a delicacy there. Actually, the, uh, the indigenous uh, people of Mexico were keeping these colonies um, hundreds of years ago before Europeans brought the European honeybee over here. Um, and so it's really interesting that this relationship has popped up in multiple continents totally independently. Um, honey's just that good. <laughs> there you go. Uh, awesome. Teresa asks, a friend from New Zealand said that most native flowers there were yellow or white and that it had something to do with the type of pollinators. Do different, different colored flowers attract bees versus butterflies, flies, honeybees? That's a great question. And it's something um, I, I'm glad you asked because I didn't have time to talk about it, but I was hoping to have time to talk about it. And so flower color and flower shape are often um, indicators of what pollinates them. It's not always, you know, a blanket statement or always true, um, but yellow uh, flowers um, and yellow, white, and blue are the most attractive colors for bees. Um, but then even within uh, those three colors, I see it break down. Like um, when I, we have trapped insects using those different colors of hands, Bumblebees seem to love blue the most, um, whereas for some reason, solitary bees and sweat bees, we would find a lot more in the yellow and white um, hands. So it might be that maybe there's more solitary bees doing the pollinating there than bumblebees. Um, but the shape of the flower is also really important. Um, I showed you guys some snapdragon from my balcony earlier and they have a closed flower and only bumblebees are heavy enough to open up the mouth of the flower and get in and have a long enough tongue to access it. And so the shape of the flower can exclude some pollinators or welcome others. I've got another example here um, of my marigold. And so it's an orange flower and it's a nice flat top. So anything can get on there. A fly can get on there, a tiny bee can get on there or a bumblebee. And so those sorts of flowers tend to be more generalist because it's like anybody can access the resources there. Awesome. Uh, Judy asks, how can one entice a bumblebee to hibernate at your home? Uh, um, that's a great question. So uh, the queens are the only ones that will overwinter. So in the fall, when the colony resources, all the flowers are starting to die, um, there's no resources for the colony and it starts to decline. Um, they'll produce new queens and males. The queens mate with the males so that they're ready when they wake up in the spring to start the colony right away. But those queens need to find somewhere safe over the winter to kind of hang out while they're waiting to get out there and, and start the next year's colonies. And so they tend to look for um, just kind of insulated uh, crevices, whether it's like uh, leaving a pile of um, litter and dead leaves and compost. Often people find them in compost piles or wood piles. Um, sometimes even people will take terracotta pots and turn them over and put uh, uh, cotton batting in them and hay to encourage. So they just like somewhere dark, safe, um, that's going to be somewhat insulated, whether you're using wood or leaf litter or cotton batting or something like that. Um, it, it can be challenging. Um, I know some people that have great success and others who don't. It's worth a shot for sure. I've had bumblebees nesting in old chickadee houses as well. So um, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, Michael asks, oh, pardon me. <clears throat> Michael asks, do bees really die after they sting or is that a myth? That's All types, totally question mark. true for honeybees. So honeybees have a stinger and it's barbed. And so um, it tends to also be one of the more painful things because of that. <laughs> um, so it's barbed. So it goes in and then it can't come out like a fish hook, right? And so um, that's okay for honeybees because they're not the ones producing the young and keeping the colony going. If they're just workers, if one dies, that colony's fine. There's lots more workers. They can keep going and laying eggs with the queen. With solitary bees, 
if their stinger ripped out every time they had to defend themselves, what would even be the point of having a stinger? <laughs> it would right. be redundant, right? And so our native solitary bees, um, they can sting multiple times, but they're incredibly docile. Um, I've been stung more often by wasps and honeybees um, than any other type of insect. I was stung once by a solitary sweat bee, and it was only because I accidentally squished her a little bit in my hand. And it was, the sting was hardly even like a pinch kind of a thing. So another reason to love native bees is even if there's tons of them in your yard, they're very non-aggressive. Awesome. We have two last questions before we wrap up. Um, Judy asks, we had and rescued carefully a hive of bees from our chimney a few years ago. Why would they have chosen such a sooty, uh, inhospitable home? Mm. Well, um, I'm assuming the chimney wasn't in use at the time. Um, maybe it was in use in the winter, but uh, when they were active in the summer, it wasn't being used. Um, but the being um, not inside, but close to a building and insulated and getting the ambient heat from the building, um, especially if it was like a brick chimney or something, that would be perfect. And maybe you had some buildup perhaps of dead vegetative material to provide some substrate for them. Or maybe there was an old bird's nest in the chimney that they decided to take up residence in. That could be another possibility as well. Awesome. Um, so uh, we have had lots of thank yous. So I'll read those and then we'll do the very last question. So Melanie and Anna say, thank you. We learned lots. Anna, especially, so the five-year-old who asked the question earlier, especially like the blue bee, the moths, bumblebees, and the swallowtail, because we've seen them at home. Um, Sheila has also said very informative presentation. Thank you. Smiley face. Uh, and then the very last question uh, is from Patty and she asks, has climate change affected the natural cycle of some pollinators? Yes, she knows the good questions to ask. It's almost like she's been listening to me blabbing about bees for years. <laughs> um, definitely, that's a really important question um, because uh, many of our native bees, uh, as I said earlier, have developed a close relationship with native plants here. Um, they've timed their life cycle to coincide with the blooming of a certain native plant. Um, unfortunately, um, plants and bees can respond to different cues from the environment with regard to the timing of these cycles. Plants are often responding to uh, daylight hours um, when they are blooming, whereas insects, when they're waking up from their uh, winter hibernation or they're hatching out of their pupil stage um, from the winter, they tend to rely not on daylight because they're underground or in a nest or something but on temperature and so you can see how if plants are taking cues from light but bees are taking cues from temperature these things can get out of sync even though they've evolved closely together for many years so that's a big threat to our native pollinators especially plants where they only will where they're specialists and they rely on a really narrow window of species to, to live and complete their life cycle Okay, awesome. Nancy, I just want to check in if there's any more questions from Facebook. Um, no, just thank you. So uh, that, that for questions now, thank you. Okay, awesome. So there are lots of thank yous uh, here as well. Tia, uh, Lynn says thank you. Many thanks for the information. Uh, Deep D says thank you. So much fun to learn about all the different types of bees. And Judy, uh, Skyla also says thank you. And Judy says glad you didn't chicken out on the costume. <laughs> 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 um, awesome. So uh, we'll wrap it up there. We have gone a little bit over time. My apologies for that, but uh, so many yeah. wonderful questions. I love it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining. And of course, I wanted to thank Tia uh, and for, for your wonderful presentation and for Nancy, uh, to Nancy as well. Um, and uh, just a reminder to everybody that this is a weekly series. So uh, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. we do a BD at home. Um, and next week we're gonna be talking about tree ecology uh, with a graduate student from, uh, from, the, from the Department of Forestry. So uh, I hope you'll join us for that as well. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great.
Any follow up wrap up? Um, just gonna. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, 